Hello, my name is Luke Bonham. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the IDEA Income Calculator. This calculator, which is an Excel document, was created by an IDEA initiative work group to inform the standard practices for determining whether someone is income eligible for an IDEA. We know that calculating income can be different for each household and is based on a lot of different factors, so we hope this addresses most of the questions that may come up. We'll start by talking about what you are responsible for as an IDEA provider. Providers will use due diligence to gather information and documentation for IDA eligibility. It's the applicant's responsibility to provide full and accurate information to the provider. Applicants should be signing a self-certification statement that you see on the screen. In the end, it's the applicant's responsibility to be truthful. You report what you know. We want the relationship with the applicant from the onset to be one of trust and collaboration rather than suspicion of fraud. For this reason, we start by reminding you that it's the applicant's responsibility to provide full and accurate information. Let's start with the IDA net worth limits. As an asset building program, we have a net worth limit of $20,000, excluding the assets and debts of a primary home, one vehicle, and some retirement savings. When we say household, we're talking about all individuals who share the use of a dwelling as a primary quarters for living and eating separate from other individuals. If you can answer yes to all the questions about a group of people, these people are considered a household for IDA eligibility purposes. Do they share a home? Do they stay at this location for the majority of the time? Do they identify as a household? And do they function as an economic unit? How they file for taxes is also one way to determine that, but we do not require that IDA providers document household size. That being said, if you do collect their income tax returns and the number listed on the taxes is different than what they report for IDA eligibility, we would require a documented explanation of why those household numbers are different. This is part of your due diligence based on what's provided. And if they're a foster youth applying for an IDA, they should be considered a household of just one person. The net worth calculation was updated in 2020. The following is the last tab of the income calculator, and it's also available as a PDF. These are the fields that should be reported by and inputted into Outcome Tracker. For net worth example, the bottom one will auto-calculate the same way Outcome Tracker would calculate IDA eligible net worth. In this example, the full net worth is $150,000, but when you exclude the assets and debts of the home and vehicle plus the retirement limit, the IDA eligible net worth drops to negative 30,000. Now let's move on to income for IDA, where you have two options. Either the applicant has been approved for a qualifying public benefit in the last 12 months, or you verify that the gross income of the applicant's household is at or below the limits for their county and household size. Oregon IDA does not require earned income. So let's look at the first tab of the income calculator. You fill out the name and the date of verification, answer the net worth question number one, and public benefits, which is question two. So for public benefits, if clients are receiving one of the public benefits listed, it means that they have already been screened for income and their limits are at or below the IDA limits. After you collect documentation for a qualifying benefit, you are done. No need to add any additional income verification. This should be a benefit award letter from within the last 12 months on letterhead or other official format listing the applicant's name and date for when the benefit was issued, not just a copy of a SNAP card. That's then what you save for their income eligibility. If not, then you use the IDA income limits. NPA, NP updates income charts by county each spring when HUD and HHS release updated numbers. This usually happens sometime in April. The income limits are then built into the income calculator by county and we send out a new income calculator. If an applicant is over income one year but qualifies after new limits are updated, you just need to make sure they re-qualify with an application date and income verification that happens after the income numbers were updated. The income calculation is about forecasting the year ahead, not the past year. So the most recent two months of income gives a snapshot for their future income. This is a summary of what is considered consistent income and should be included in income calculations. I won't go into all of it, but on the include the exclude tab, you can read through all the details about what to include and exclude and what to consider. For example, there are detailed considerations for SSI, cash, full-time students, unemployment, and more. Copies of pay stubs are the preferred documentation. If pay stubs aren't available, bank statements or letters from the employer are acceptable with as much detail as possible. 
For tax returns, NP does not require nor recommend that individual income tax returns be collected and stored for every applicant, but rather only when you find it's the only or best method for verifying income. Having filed income taxes is not a requirement for opening an IDA, thus it should not be presented as required. Tax returns can be used to document income if the most recent year accurately represents their current income. Schedule C's are a common way to document small business income, but remember to protect personal identifying information, such as blacking out social security numbers or keeping only the relevant forms in digital or paper storage. Even if the income, uh, even if the client doesn't have consistent income, you wanna start with the consistent income tab where you fill out the county and household fields on the top right, which determine what income numbers are used. On consistent income, then you start with each source of income listing the household member and the source from the dropdown. Then you determine the frequency received. This is based on documentation, not what the person says. This will inform your annual income calculation. For example, you have to decide whether they are paid two times a month or every other week by looking at the pay stub dates. Do they land on the same day both months? That's two times a month. Are they exactly two weeks apart for four weeks? That's every two weeks. And the difference alone can make or break their income total. You put the gross income amounts listed on the documentation, not the net amounts. It needs to be for at least the last eight weeks. So a weekly pay period would need eight pay stubs, two times a month or bi-weekly would need four pay stubs. All overtime should be included for IDA income calculations when present on a pay stub, even if the applicant says they do not receive overtime regularly. If overtime puts them above the income limits and overtime is not something they get regularly, you may decide to include more than two months of income to show income over a greater period of time, but it must always include the most recent two months. What should you do about gaps in documentation? There should be documentation for a full two months. If the applicant receives $0 for a pay period, it should be written in as $0 and paste up or documentation signed by the participant explaining why there's a gap in a regular source of income. If a participant with consistent income got laid off a month ago, has not received unemployment or another source of regular income, pay stubs should be provided for the month of income plus a signed statement or documentation showing they had zero income for the other time period in question. Now onto the inconsistent and small business income. Here are some examples of what would be included. National data tells us that one in five households experiences income volatility moderate to significant income fluctuations from month to month. So we should be expecting to navigate inconsistent sources of income as well. Find the inco uh, inconsistent and small business income tab. There are many boxes on this page that all feed into the main calculation. Use a separate calculation box for each source of inconsistent income. You won't have to fill in each field, only those that are applicable. Let's talk small business first. This one's the most straightforward. You list number one, the source of income is small business, and then fill in number eight, the net annual small business income. Ideal is a profit and loss statement for an existing small business. If you're a micro enterprise provider, you may need to support them with their profit and loss statement before applying. If they are providing taxes, it must be for the most recent tax year and represent their current situation accurately. Same tab, year round inconsistent income. Some sources of income are earned at inconsistent intervals, but still year round. Example would be working as a day laborer. You can see in this example, you use questions one to four to describe the income. You use question five to document lump sum amounts and question six to identify how many whole months the payments represent. For example, if these four amounts were received over a four month time period, put four in that field. Again, this is for inconsistent income that is year round to arrive at a monthly average. Inconsistent income for seasonal work maybe a summer swim instructor, you would skip questions five and six and just use field seven to record this income as lump sum for the year. When all sources of income have been recorded, you will come back to the consistent income tab for a grand total calculation at the bottom. You can see here, the applicant had a little over 50,000 in consistent income, a little over 10,000 in inconsistent income and a total income of $61,080. Based on their county and household size, they income qualify for an IDA. Everything in the income calculator should have documentation to accompany it. Because you calculate based on the documentation, not what the participant tells you, 
and people also look at the documentation to confirm that we agree with your calculation if we're looking into the way you calculated somebody's income. And that is it. You need to save it in Excel format for each client. You need to make sure you're always using the most up-to-date calculator to ensure that the income limits are accurate. Know that this process can be difficult. Situations are all different. If you aren't sure, ask for guidance. If somebody increases their income or net worth after they are enrolled, it's okay. They can still stay in the IDA. This is all about their financial situation at enrollment. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great day.